Little Chapel Church, stand to your feet. This morning we're going to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Ancient One, the Ancient of Days. Psalms 90 says, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in history, He is in charge of your destiny. He is in charge of history, and He's the only one who commands it. He is the Ancient of Days, and He is worthy of our praise. So let there be joy in this house this morning as we worship you, King, as we worship you, Ancient of Days, blessing and honor, glory and power to you. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the Ancient of Days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the Ancient of Days. Tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh ancient of days. Blessing, blessing in all.
worship with announcements this morning. That was so good. Welcome to Little Chapel Church. We are so thankful that you're here this morning. It's good to see each and every one of you. If you are new with us or would like to know more information about who we are, we would love to get that to you. And here's an easy way for you to do that. You can take out your phone and text the word welcome to this number, 618-777-6779. We also have amazing services going on for our kids right now. So if you have children you would like to check in, you can visit the check-in desk in the foyer. And we're just so glad you're here with us today. Everybody say hi to Pastor Ed. Hello. Hello. He loves being up here to do announcements, let me tell you. He's so happy about this. She lies. (laughs) Maybe. Uh, We wanted to let our men know that the Watchman service is tonight at 6 p.m., so make sure, men, that you come for that. I think Mike Oldham's giving it a ringing endorsement over here, so make sure you don't miss that. We also have next week our newcomer lunch on the 30th, and if you would like to come for that, if you've not been to one, would like to know even more about Little Chapel, meet the staff, um, have a delicious meal, you can sign up on the app, the website, or at the Welcome Center for that. And the reason that Pastor Ed is up here is to give you some more information about a special guest that we have coming in February. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, I want to read a short verse in Galatians 4.25. It says, Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Okay? We've got a fellow coming in a couple weeks. His name is... uh, Joel Richardson, you see the announcement up there. He'll be here the 4th through the 6th. On the Friday night, the 4th at 6.30, he's going to come, and he actually climbed the Mount Sinai in Arabia. He did it once before it was legal. He snuck into Saudi Arabia and climbed it. And then I think he was the first one to get visas to take a group up to climb that. So you'll get to see this mountain, this blackened-top mountain with a big split rock down here with, I mean, all the signs of Mount Sinai from the Bible. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the Saudis know it's important. They have a fence around it and guard guard houses. So um, anyway, he'll be here on the 4th. On the 5th, he'll be here uh, in the evening. We're going to divide it into two sessions. So come at 6 and get ready to stay a long time. He's going to talk about Islamic eschatology, I believe, or something along that line. He's also working with the church in Iran and Afghanistan. And some of you have seen the little video, uh, Sheep Among Wolves, Volume 2. Anyone seen that? Raise your hand if Anyone, anyone, a couple back there. It's about the church growing in Iran. It's the fastest growing church in the world, uh, percentage-wise. It's growing percentage-wise faster than any church in the world, the church in Iran. And Joel is uh, directly involved with that. They did the video. They have contacts there. They have contacts in Afghanistan now, are helping the church in Afghanistan right now. So he, he, all of his books, which he's written a lot of them, he is a New York Times bestseller. I don't know, but anyway. He's got a lot of books, several videos, uh, a lot of material, and it's all online free to read. When I was in Morocco, I couldn't go to a Christian bookstore and buy a book. I sat in my, in my room and read Joel Richardson's books because I could get them online for free. And what kind of guy does that? Who offers all of his materials, his videos, and everything free? I really want to support him not only as uh, just a speaker coming to our church, but as a, a ministry that someone's doing something that we can't do. He's reaching people we don't reach. And, uh, you know, there's a need there. And he's put out all, all of his materials for free. I do have about uh, 350 pounds of books in my room right now. 
Uh, so he, did, he, is, he does have some books here. So you could buy his books, and that would be a way of supporting his ministry also. But I, I encourage that. He's, he's a man that I don't learn a whole lot from different individuals right now. But, you know, when I listen to him, I'm still learning a lot. I learn, I learn something from everybody. But when I listen to him, I'm still learning a lot about the Bible, things that I thought I already knew. And I'm, when he's teaching, I'm thinking, oh, my. I never thought of that. I never saw that. So, Pastor Ed, somebody may be sitting here and thinking, I don't, that's not eschatology. I don't even know what that means. Okay. That's not interesting to me. Why should I come? It's, it's end times. And when we talk about Muslim eschatology, what's interesting is uh, there's a major group of the Islamic faith that has a, a, a belief system that is parallel with Christianity. In fact, it's the same thing, basically, except their good guys are our bad guys and our bad, you know, vice versa. Their bad guys are our good guys. It's amazing. But, you know, Satan had 600 years from the time of Jesus to, to Muhammad to come up with an idea, and all he had to do is just take the old idea and switch things around. So I think when you see that, it's fascinating. Uh, when you hear the, the things that he has to say, he is a, a very, uh, probably one of the most astute Bible studiers. I, he doesn't call himself a theologian, but I don't know what would one would be that would be more than him. But anyway, uh, I really encourage you to come out, make an investment while he's here. You won't hear this. He, I don't know if I could share this or not. Is this being live stream? Oh, that's unfortunate. Well, they just have to come. They just have to come. Well, I, but this information he wouldn't say. But anyway, he got someone probably kicked off a major news network having done an interview with him because of the things he shared, which were just a little bit too pointed towards what we talked about, this Islamic eschatology stuff. So let's just say that... Uh, People in high places, some of them are, uh, even some of our networks that we think are, are friendlier, some of them are owned by, owned by Saudi princes, let's just say that, okay. So anyway, uh, I really encourage you to come out, I think it'll be worth your while. Uh, it's an opportunity we won't have too often to have someone uh, like this here, and I really want it to be us encouraging the ministry that he's doing. I hope Sunday morning we're going to hear about the Afghani church and the Iranian church and what's going on in those countries. And it's, it's really remarkable. I've seen some of the interviews with some of the people there. The many uh, people in Afghanistan that have seen the man in white come to them in a dream. That's why they're getting saved in Afghanistan as Jesus is appearing to them. And so uh, fascinating stuff. People that he's had contact with and is interviewed with. I've watched the interviews and that kind of thing. So, And if you ever want to make a trip up Mount Sinai in Arabia, I think he's probably got another one scheduled. I got an invitation to the first one, but he, we'd never met face to face. He didn't know that I was an old man with heat exhaustion problems that would have been laying at the bottom of the mountain with someone pouring water on my head because <laughs> it's probably like 110 degrees and you're carrying a 50-pound backpack. But adventure, Guys, if you ever want some adventure, this is this would be real adventure. So just encourage you to come. And we also have flyers for this available um, out on the Welcome Center. So if you want more information with the times, you can grab one of those. Just print it upside down. Oh, or you could just flip it around. Oh. That works too. Before Pastor Ed prays over our offering um, and our baptisms, which we're getting ready to have, which is so exciting, let me just inform you that if you would like to give to the work of Little Chapel Church, we have several ways you can do that. You can do it online through our app, website. We have buckets at the back, or if you're watching online this morning, you can mail your gift in. Um, we're so thankful that you give to the work of the Lord through this church. And we, we want to be responsible. We want to be good stewards of what the Lord has given us. So, Pastor Ed, will you pray for us? I will. Father, we thank you that you are a provider, Lord. No, no matter what we have, the truth about you is you are the one who will provide for those that, that look to you and call upon you. And, Lord, we're thankful that you're faithful to us. Even in times when we've been in fear that you're not going to be, Lord, you're faithful even when we're not. So, Lord, we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to share with what you've given us and to, to give back to the ministry and to give back to, to things that are, are causing fruit worldwide. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd bless each giver, Lord, that you'd, you'd show them, Lord, your, your, uh, your ways, Lord, how to walk in your ways, that we can walk in confidence as we just walk with you in faithfulness, even in our giving. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd bless that, that offering and whatever's given today and through this week. And, Lord, we pray for these that are being baptized. Lord, I pray that today, Lord, you, they would not only go down in water, but they would have an encounter with you. 
Lord, that you would seal something in their hearts. And Lord, like it says in the Bible, you would cut away the old man. You'd cut away the old man, and this would be a new beginning, being baptized into your death and raised into your life. We pray for uh, power just to rest upon them, the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, family. Good morning, family. I'm, uh, I'm the less buff, not TW. He's uh, sick this morning, so we need to pray for him. But uh, he called me last night to stand in. I'm Brent Jones. I'm one of the elders here. So uh, we're going to baptize some this morning. And how many of you say, yee raw, right? Amen. Yes. Amen. We were talking about it in Sunday school, but, you know, we got to remind ourselves they are looking over the balconies in heaven this morning, cheering, cheering that we're baptizing these. Amen. We, we have something to celebrate. We have been given in Jesus a salvation that is greater, that is greater. So as we baptize these, I think it would be awesome if we just erupted in cheers. Would that be okay? Can we do that this morning? Right? Okay. So. It's good. It's good. I'm going to invite Joel and his dad this morning, and dad's going to baptize Joel. Come on in. It's it's warm. Thank you, trustee. Woo, it's good. We'll take warm. That's a good thing. Morning, Joel. Joel. Excuse me. Joel. So, Joel is here because he has given his life to Jesus. Joel, is there anything that, yeah, isn't that good? Yes. Yes. Dad's going to lift him up there. Is, uh, is there anything you want to say this morning, Joel? Go ahead. Yay. Yay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Joel, as part of your public testimony that you have given your life to Jesus, I would ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he was raised from the dead after dying on the cross for your sins? Yes. And you believe and put your trust in him that going forward, you're going to live for him every day for the rest of your life. Yes. If that's true, then Dad's going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I say, God bless you. And we're going to cheer like crazy. Amen. Yes! Woo! Next, we're going to welcome Case. Come on, Case. Everybody say, hey, Case. Come on, Case. All right. Case was helping me out last week in 456. He's hilarious. He's got skills. But, Case, you know Jesus now. Is that right? Awesome. Anything you want to say to everybody? I'm just grateful to be here. Awesome. Right? Isn't that good? So, well, we're glad you're here, and it's a huge deal. And we just want to make sure that you know, and we know that you do, that you have believed and do believe that Jesus is the Son of God believe that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again three days later? Yes. And you're putting your faith and trust in him for a life lived before him all the rest of your days. Is that right? Yes. Awesome. Well, it's my honor to baptize you, my friend Case, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I'll hold your hands like this and here we go. Ready? Doing good. All right, come on, Benji. It's warm. it's warm, right? It's not bad. It's not too bad. We were free, planning on freezing. All right, this is Benji. Say hey, Benji. There they are. It's not so scary, is it? All right. Anything you want to say, Mr. Benji? Uh, no. No, no. Okay. All right, Benji. Well, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah. Yes. Good. And you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? You yes. believe he rose from the grave three days later? You believe he's going to be your king and you're going to live for him all your days now? Is that right? Yep. Awesome. Me too. That's great. Isn't that great? So, we're going to baptize you. Scared. You're scared? What are you scared of? He's like, oh, I don't want to get away anymore. Well, it's going to be awesome and quick. I promise to be quick. Okay? Okay. So, you're going to hold your nose like this, but I'm going to baptize you, okay? okay. And we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, okay? Up here, right here, and the water just a little bit around here. The 
the water's right there, but you're going to go under. Is that okay? What's this white thing? I don't know what that white thing is. You ready to be baptized? What do you say? We're just living real here, okay? All right, you ready? We're ready now. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Woo! Say, hey, Lily. Hey. There they are. Come on, Lily. How are you, sis? Doing good? Boy, that's really warm. It's really warm. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Anything you want to say this morning to everybody? Uh, that's it, huh? Nothing else? That's okay. Well, let's talk. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again three days later? Yeah. You're going to live for him for the rest of your life. Is that right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. And we're going to baptize you this morning. I'm going to ask you to hold your nose, okay? I'm going to baptize you from under here in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we go. Yes. All right, Rachel, come on. Here we go. This is mom to these last two kids. Come on, mom. Welcome, Rachel. Welcome. So, Rachel, anything you want to say? Not a word. That's okay. That's okay. Rachel, have you given your life to Jesus and you believe that he's the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins and rose three days later? Okay, well, praise the Lord. Let's baptize him. Is that all right? So, hold your nose. Here we go. And we'll say, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. And um, I've never been properly baptized. I figured it's about time. sins. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So Lord, ooh, he's with us. So Lord, I just pray even now, God, even now, Lord, as we touch, as we believe, Lord, that you would do a mighty work here and we baptize Justin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. on now. God is good, huh? I'm telling you, if there's a day to get baptized, today is the day to get baptized. It is 107 degrees in that water right now. You may just want to jump in there just to jump in there. 
You know, afterwards, what? You know, my hot tub's not even that hot. So, uh, man, uh, man, God is good, and I'm excited to be able to share God's word with you this morning. Can we pray real quick? Can we pray? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for those that uh, are following you through baptism this morning. God, I thank you for those that decided to say yes to you this morning. And God, that their uh, relationship with you God is no longer private, is no longer just something that they have with inside, but God, now they are publicly professing, God, that which has happened on the inside. God, that they are made new in Christ, that once they were dead, now they are raised in Christ Jesus, forever changed, forever renewed, never the same again. So, Lord, we give you the praise and glory for that. And, God, many of us here this morning, God, we've walked down those steps into water, God, to, uh, to profess our faith in you. So, Lord, I thank you for even these this morning, God, that have followed you even through baptism. So, God, I pray as this morning, God, as we hear your word, God, let it fall on hearts that are ready to receive and hear from you this morning, we pray. God, I pray that I would get out of the way so, God, that your, your word can be heard this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. This morning, um, this morning we're going to look at a text many of you know, I'm sure. It's found in Revelations chapter 2. Revelation, not shins, Revelation. Make sure I correct myself. I know that Ed later will correct me. It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 through 5. It's a very common uh, verse. It's a very common uh, section in the Bible as far as many that, that, that know it. It's a, it's, a, it's a scripture that Jesus is, is saying that sometimes even as I read it, um, it's easy for us to fall um, into this category. It's easy for us to uh, find ourselves in this situation as sometimes maybe as a church or even as an individual. And here's what it says. If you have a, uh, it's in red lettering, so we know it's Jesus that is speaking here. It says, I know the works. It says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. You have not grown weary, but I have this against you. Don't you just love that? <laughs> you know, uh, don't you just love that when somebody just kind of pumps, pumps you up a little bit, they, 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 they get you excited and say, man, you know, you're doing such a great job. If you're a young person, your parents may do this. Uh, if, you're, have a, if you're working and your, your boss may do this and say, you know, you're doing a great job, man. I really notice how you're sweeping the floors. I, I notice how your paperwork is so neat. I, I notice how you you're keep doing these things over and over. And hey, I, man, I notice you've been taking out the trash without me telling you doing that. I've noticed how you kept your room clean. Man, it is you have been doing a wonderful job. But however, oh, really? <laughs> really? You're going to, man, I've, I've been feeling so good. And, and here's G Jesus, the writer. Jesus is saying, I know the works. I know your works. I know your toil, I know your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you've not grown weary. And he says this, he goes on to say, but I have this one thing against you. I have this one thing against you, and he says that you have abandoned the love you had at first. You have abandoned the love that you have at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. 
the church of Ephesus, we too can fall easily prey to the cold, mechanical relationship with Christ if we're not careful. No amount of zeal for the truth or moral, moral righteousness can replace a heart full of love with Jesus. Can I tell you that Jesus is more concerned with your love for him than the things that you do? Can I tell you that? So many times we're so interested in doing that which is right rather than allowing God to fulfill our hearts and allowing the love for him motivating us to do that which is right. A few weeks ago, I was telling the young people to stop, be, stop doing the right thing. Aren't you glad you're sending your kids to youth group? I'm going to tell you guys, stop doing the right thing. Just stop it. I said, what, what are you talking about? Stop doing that. So many times we're, we're well, I, I, I don't drink because I, I know it's not right. I, I, I don't cuss because I know it's not right. I don't uh, gossip because I know it's not right. You know, I don't sleep around because I'm married and I know it's not right. There's a lot of things that I tr try my hardest to do because I know that it's the right thing to do. And I keep trying and I keep trying, I keep trying. I just want to continue to do the right thing. Can I tell you is that the only time when you continue to follow in that type of uh, uh, path, you become more performance driven rather than be driven by the love of Christ that is within you. I choose to do with what's right because of my love that I have for the Father. And realizing the cry, realizing how much Christ loves me, it moves me to do the right thing. I don't have to try to do with what is right because I find myself falling each and every moment. I find myself falling so very short of doing the right things in life or whatever society says, the world says, this is right and this is wrong. Instead, I allow Christ's love in me to show me what is right and what is wrong. But it's so easy for us to become so performance driven. It's so easy for us to fall into this category where we have lost our first love. We get so occupied for doing uh, the right thing, serving in the right areas and doing what I should do, what I think I should do as a believer. And years go by and years go by and we find ourselves just simply doing rather than being in love with Jesus. I want us to be in love with him each and every day, day, each and every moment, each and every year that we fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus, deeper and deeper in love with him. You say, well, I love him. I go to church. I, I do all these things. But are you doing all these things because you think that's what I should be doing? Because those that are Christians, that's what they do. Are you, but are you doing these things because of the love that you have for the Father? It's so easy to lose that first love. It's so easy to become a performance-driven believer. It's so easy to do that. Jesus is talking about the first love. It's likened to when you first got married. You remember that? You remember, you remember that excitement you had when you uh, found the one that you're going to love for the rest of your life? Do you remember that day, that moment? You remember that she is the one, that he is the one, that I cannot wait to, to spend time with that person. If I, can just, if I can just make it through the sleepless night, I'll just wake up the next morning. If I can just hear her voice for one moment, if I can just hear, have uh, sense his touch for one moment, then my whole day, I know my whole day would be perfect. Do you remember how it was? Or have we been married too long? 
I mean, too many years have gone by where we have forgotten that first love. Where, where, where as men, I know that when I first met Bethany, she, we were at camp. She was a counselor at kids camp and our relationship began to grow. And as we begin to know each other, something began to happen. A love began to grow. And because that love began to grow, I wanted to make sure she knew that I loved her. I wanted to make sure that she knew that she was the only one for me. That's why I opened the car door for her. That's why I said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You don't touch the car door handle. That, that's my job. Here, let me open the car door for you. No, no, you, you don't need to walk in first and open that door. Here, let, let me open the door for you. you my, my love is expressed. Through, let, let me just open this door for you so you can walk on in. I want to show you my love that I have for you. You're not paying for a meal here. I'm going to take care of it. If I can just drive a little bit, uh, a little bit today to see her. See, she, drove, she lived about 45 minutes from where I lived. She lived in a small mountain town in California. And a uh, small town, small area. Uh, and it would snow a lot. And because we were in love, man, I just wanted to spend... Every day I could with her. You know what I mean? It's like you just couldn't go a day without spending time with the one that you love. Yeah, we're not going to miss a day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive to your house, whatever the cost, whatever the risk it is. So there was this one day and it was snowing and I decided to make the drive up this mountain, 30-minute drive up this mountain to where she lived. And when we talk about snow, it's not the snow that we get here. It's, it's the kind of snow that sticks around for the next three months. It stays there where plow trucks, they are constantly going in and out. Where there's so much snow that it just compacts onto the, the, the highways and the, the roads. And it just stays there for the next three months until the the weather changes and the sun comes out and the heats up and the snow melts away. We're talking about this type of snow. And here I am in my Dodge Neon with studded tires, by the way, because that's what you had. So driving up this snow. And I remember when I got there, the weather wasn't too bad, but it snowed the whole time when I got to her parents' house. And before I know it, there had been accumulated about a, a foot and a half to almost two feet of snow on the roads, which I hadn't even realized at the time. I got in my car and I headed back home that night. There was so much snow on the ground was the snow plows hadn't even gone through yet. And I am making the ruts. I am making my own trail in the highway as I'm driving back to my own house. The worst thing I could ever do. Thinking about it now, I thought, man, that, that was pretty crazy. Why would I even choose to do that? Where I didn't even know if I was on the right lane or the left lane. All I knew that I was on a road. And any minute I could, I could slid off the road and there wasn't guardrails. I can go over the cliff, you know, <laughs> down the mountain. But at that particular time, at that particular moment, the risk isn't what I was more concerned about. What I was more concerned about was spending time with the one that I loved the most. The one that I was going to marry. The one I was going to spend my life with forever. That's the one thing that really motivated me to do some things that other people normally wouldn't do. I wouldn't do that for someone who I was just acquainted with, someone that I wasn't passionate for, someone that I maybe I cared about, but I didn't care about enough to risk everything about me. I did that because of the, the love that I cared for her. But something begins to take place even within marriage, can I say, is that as years go by, all of a sudden that door is not open as much. You know, that, that front door, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I should have got that for you. 
something begins to change, something begins to take place. And I have to begin to change. We have to begin to change. We have to remember, I have to pray, God, I want that passion again. I want that excitement again that, that drove me to reckless and crazy things because of the love that I have for my wife. And we too as believers, as time goes by and as moments go by, we too can fall prey to a, at times, a cold, mechanical relationship with Christ. So here's 24 evidences that you may have lost your first love. You can go hours or days without having more than a, than a passing thought of him. You don't have a strong desire to spend time with him, Christ. You don't have a strong hunger for the word. Bible reading is a chore, something to mark off your to-do list. Spending time in prayer is a burden, duty, rather than a delight. Your worship is formal, dry, lifeless, merely going through the emotions. Private prayer or worship are almost non-existent, cold and dry. You are more concerned about physical health, well-being, and comfort than about the well-being of your condition of your soul. You crave physical food rather than little, rather uh, whether, uh, while having little appetite for spiritual food. You spend more time and effort in your physical appearance than cultivating an inner spiritual beauty to please Christ. Your heart towards Christ is cold and indifferent, not tender as it once was, not easily moved by the word, talk of spiritual and spiritual things. Christianity is more of a checklist rather than a relationship with Christ. Is this hard stuff? Is this hard to hear? Are any of these things you're like, you want to get real, you want to get honest? Because this is real and honest stuff. Your obedience and service are motivated and fueled by expectations of others or a desire to impress others more than by, by a passion for Christ. You find yourself become more resentful over the hardships and demands of serving Christ and others. You talk with others about kids, marriage, and weather and the news, but struggle to talk about the Lord in spiritual matters. You enjoy sex, sexual, 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 secular, <laughs> be careful. Don't laugh. <clears throat> See, now you made me lose my spot. You enjoy secular songs, movies, and books more than songs and reading materials that point you to Christ. You are more inter in rec interested in rec recreation, entertainment, and having fun than a cultivating intimate intimacy with Christ through worship, prayer, and the Word and Christian fellowship. You display, display attitude or involved in activities that you know are contrary to scriptures, but you continue to do them anyways. You have been drawn back into sin, sin habits that you put off when you, were young, when you were a younger believer. Little things that used to disturb you, disturb your con uh, conscience, no longer do. You're self-righteous more concerned about sin in others' lives than about your own. You tend, you tend to hold tightly to money and things rather than being quick to give to the meeting of the needs of others. You rarely give sacrificially to the Lord's work. You are not the first one. I am not the first one to, experiencing, to experience this, this paralyzing lack of happiness in Christ. 
You are not the first one whose heart towards Christ has become cold. You are not the first one who has forgotten. You are not the first one who treat Christianity as a hobby. This church looked amazing on paper. It looked amazing. Patient endurance, tolerance of evil, suffering for Christ's namesake, exposing the false prophets. But, but I have this against you. They, they did some great things. They built some great things. They, they did some amazing work. But I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Do you remember do you remember what it was like when you first came to know the Lord as your personal and Lord and Savior? Or has it been too long? Has it been too long? They privately were abandoning Christ in their public crusade for the truth about Christ. And because Christ loved them so much, and because Christ loves us so much, you and I, he tells us three things that we must do. One thing he says to remember. 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 Remember, therefore, for, uh, from where you have, where you have fallen. Fallen. Remembering is a mental action that we must do. We cannot bring ourselves anywhere unless we remember where we have come from. And I realize that as believers, we don't live in the past anymore, but we're saved and we're set free from the past. We don't live in condemnation and guilt and shame anymore. Christ has freed us from the past and how we once were. He's freed us from that. We are now to move forward into where he is leading us. But there are times that we must remember where we have come from. We must remember the very pit that God has reached down and took you out of. Do you remember? Remember, do you remember your life? Do you remember how it was when you first when you first met Christ? Do you remember the addictions that were upon you? Do you remember your attitude that you once were? Do you remember how it was? Do you remember when God first awakened your soul? When at first you were dead in sin, but now he has awakened your soul and you're alive in Christ. And you can't help but sing a little bit longer. You can't help but raise your hands a little bit higher. You can't help but tell everyone around you what Christ has done in and through your life. Do you remember what it was, church? I'm calling you to, to, to come back if it's you this morning. To come back and remember, to remember all that Christ has done for you, or has it been too, for too, too long? Oh, man, I've been a believer so long now. Oh, I've been a believer so long. I've gone through the motions so long. I've sung so many songs. I've served in so many areas. Man, I don't even know. But man, I, my, my heart sings, my heart desires to, to, to want that first love again. My heart desires to want that, that desire again where nothing else matters but, but my relationship with Christ, that money can't solve it, things can't provide for it. It doesn't matter, but all I want is that relationship with Jesus. And if I have to give it all up, then I'm going to give it all up because the only one that I'm worried about the only one that I want to risk anything for is my relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because of what he has done for me on that cross on Calvary 2,000 years ago. I will never forget all that he has done for me. Are we just going through the motions? Are we just coming to church because that's what we do as Christians? But it is something that you wake up and you're like, man, today is a day that I get to enter in God's house and I get to give him praise and I get to give him glory and I get to sing and I get to be with other believers and I get to serve him. Oh, man. Let us not be a people. Let us not be a church that is 
looks good on a piece of paper. Oh, little chapel church, you know all the things that they've done. Man, they've done some amazing things, haven't they? They built an amazing building. They did some incredible things. They did some amazing outreaches. Oh, they look good on a piece of paper, but let us be remembered. Let us be known, not for the things that we do, but how much we love Jesus. Let us be remembered as a church, those people out there on that hill, man, they love Jesus. They love him. You can just tell how much they love Jesus. They love him. Let us be known as a people. Let us be known as a person who loves, loves Jesus. Do you remember? Do you remember the quiet mo mornings that you chose to wake up early and spend some time with him? Do you remember those moments? When I think about the Lord and how he saved me and how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and he turned me around and he set, set my feet on solid ground. What does it want? What does it make me want to do, man? I want to what? I want to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you saw something in me that I didn't see. I remember when I first came to the Lord, I was much like many of you that was raised in church my whole entire life. Church was never an option. I went to church. My family was involved in ministry. And it's one of my fears for even young people sometimes is sometimes we can get so used to doing church. We get so used to come. It's never an option. And, it's, you know, as parents, we raise our kids in the faith. And that's our call. And I was one of those, one of those kids. I was one of those. I remember I was a freshman in, in high school at winter camp. And there I was sitting in the back, very back row. My family was involved in ministry. I always went to church. I always went to Sunday school. I always went to everything. And there I was in the back row. As I sat there, I realized that I had never accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Fear came over me. Not the fear of, it should be the fear of spending eternity separated from Christ Jesus, but the fear of what would people think of me if I acknowledged that I wasn't a true follower of Jesus. But I didn't care. And the altar call came forward and I waited. But God just moved on my heart and pressed on my heart. I could not get away, to, away from it. It was a, like a weight upon me like I've never felt before. And in that moment, I stood to my feet and I walked down from that chair in the very back row. And I came forward and I met the youth, the youth pastor, Steve Donaldson, at the time. And I and I. As, I came before him, I said, you know, I've never asked Christ as my Lord and Savior. And today, I want to do that. This very moment, I want to do that. This very time, I want to declare that he's going to be my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, nothing's going to change that. I'm going to continue to follow him all the days of my life. And my youth pastor, you know what he said? You know what he didn't say? He didn't say, what are we talking about? I, I, I thought you were already a Christian. He didn't say any of those things. He said, he, he said okay, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And he led me in prayer. And I sat back down. I still remember those moments. I still remember that moment the next morning as we spent time in chapel getting ready to head home. And as we sat there, he, uh, it was testimony time. And all the kids would share their testimony. There I sat. And he did to me like I do to a lot of our young people, mainly because he did it to me first. You see, I wanted it to be 
more of a personal decision. Where Christ says, no, it is a personal, but it needs to be public as well. My youth pastor knew that, and he pointed at me. He says, Ronnie, you have something to share. <laughs> I'm like, okay, right. So I walked up there, and there in front of all my peers that knew me the best or knew me because of the youth group that I was a part of there, I said, so last night I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. A few years later, I received God's call to ministry, and I've never turned back since. Do you remember? Do you remember what it was like? Do you remember where God has called you out of from? Jesus says, remember. Remember. Remember how much I love you. Remember how much I care for you. Do you know that he does love you this morning? Despite if you are cold and indifferent, he, he loves you. Do you know that? He loves you. The second thing he says is to repent. Repent calls us to turn away and is marked by, the, by, by fruit. His, his repentance is... It's important because it gets us back to our first love. It gets us back to letting go of something so we can regain something that we once possessed. I want to let go of this one thing. I want to repent from it. I want to let go of it so I can receive the one thing that I once had. If you left Jerusalem for Egypt promised land to Canaan. We don't just try to do better next time. Next time I'll just try to do better. I just I just don't feel guilty. You don't feel guilty and your Savior is crying out for you. Confessing our coldness to him and asking him for grace and mercy, God, I have fallen cold to your voice. Your voice is so silent. It's not clear anymore. I have become so mechanical in my faith. Lord, forgive me. You repent in the face of a loving Savior. Not a Savior that brings condemnation and guilt, but one that receives you with open hands. The one that is like the prodigal son who remembered where he was, remembered the life that he had and as he remembered he came back and repented to his father only to find a father that wasn't wasn't going to point a finger at him to say you deserve what you got instead he found a father that was willing to open that had his arms open wide ready to receive him and 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 bring him back into a fellowship into a union into a love of the father that his son desired once again once you come back let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. When we love Jesus, we begin to love what he loves and we begin to hate what he hates. The church of Ephesus <clears throat> was doing all the right things. But they, they, but they lost the very thing that motivated them from doing those things. What's your motivation this morning? Is our motivation reputation? I want to look like a believer. I have a reputation and I want to continue to look like this one that I identify with. And, and because of that, that's... I'm afraid that my reputation will change. I want to look like a believer. Is it repetitiveness? It's just what I've always done. I've always done it, man, for years. I grew up in the church. This is what I've always done. I, I don't know anything else. I don't, I don't know what it's like to not come to church on a Sunday morning. It's weird. 
I don't know what it's like. Some of us realized what it was like when last year when COVID, you know, we had to shut the church down. You're like, oh, this is, wow, I don't like this lifestyle. I don't like this. Everyone else felt that way? I like going to church. I like being around other believers. I don't like being isolated. Is that a repetitiveness or is it love? It's a love that I have for Jesus. And if you're not there yet, you simply say, God, man, I want to love you with all my heart, soul, and mind. Jesus, I want to love you where you are the only one, the only thing that ever matters in my life. Second thing, third thing I mean is to do, we're closing. The worship team can come on out. We're going to close with worship. You do. There's an active, there's an active action and, and change that needs to be done. What is pulling you and keeping you away from, the, from your first love today, we let it go. If it's keeping me from my first love, then I let it go because I realize this is the only thing that matters to me. I'm going to remember, I'm going to repent, and then I'm going to begin to do. My doing is not based out of obligation, but it's based out of a love that I have for the Father. The door is not locked, church. The door is not locked. The, the story is not over yet. As long as you still have breath, God still, you have still have time to seek him. You can have this amazing relationship again. I don't know. Can I get back to, to that? Can I get back to those first moments of loving Christ, those first few years of loving the Lord? Can I get back to that? It seems like I've just gone so far. That it seems so far away. Can I get back to that moment? Can I get away from and strip it all down and say that it's, man, I, I want to get back to, to, to loving Christ how I once was, where it's going to give up everything so I can risk everything for him and for his name's sake. It seems like I'm just too far, too far away from that. And God is calling, Christ is calling out your name once again this morning and says, won't you come back to me? Ronnie, won't you come back to me? Wipe off the sleepiness out of your eye. And wake up so you can hear my voice once again. I desire to commune with you. I desire to spend time with you. I desire to speak to you. Get away from the mechanical, cold relationship of Christ and come in to the loving knowledge of a saving God who loves you and cares for you and desperately wants a relationship with you each and every day. Get back to the excitement of loving him. That's you this morning. He's calling your name. He is saying... Don't let today pass you by. Don't let this moment pass you by. Don't let this hour passing you by. You're not here by accident this morning. He knew that you're going to be here. And he knew that he wanted so much more for you. Won't we come back to God? Won't we come back to that first love, that first excitement? This is that moment. Would you stand with me? As we worship a little bit, would you allow God's spirit to fill you? As we worship a little bit, as we sing these songs, we allow them not to be simply songs that we sing because they're pretty and they're nice and they make us feel somewhat good inside. But we allow them to be songs that will express our heart and our love that we have for the Father. Would you come back? It's my desire. It's my desire 
that I continue to walk in the love of Christ, that my love for him is expressed through all that I do and all that I say. Oh, Lord, I want to get back to that first love. I want to get back to more than just the excitement, but knowing that you love me and, and you knowing that I love you. I want to get back to hating the things that you hate, loving the things that you love. I want to get back. I want to come back to you. I don't want to just simply do church anymore. I want to be the church. I don't want to simply do church. I want to be the church that wherever you go, that wherever I am, that you are with me and that you are moving through me. That the church is, in, is impacting and it saves, you save, but we are the church. And we bring forth your word, we bring forth your love, we bring forth all that you've done in and through us. So God, as we worship this morning, let us come quick to your feet, I pray. Let us come quick to your throne, I pray. Let us come quick into your presence, I pray, knowing that we have a heavenly Father that loves us, that cares for us, that desperately wants us, that wants us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship this morning. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your living home. Your presence, Lord. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence, Lord, your presence, Jesus. Thank you. 
At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Treasures evermore. In your presence, Father, change us. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore in me the joy of my salvation. Bring us back to you, Lord, our first love. And we wait for your glory, Lord. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. the name above every other name. Yes, he is. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
we sing that bridge again, I will build my life. You know, this week, it's quite ironic that the guy over here and myself, on the same night this week, we both got a phone call from our wives that we entered, they entered our house and it was smoky, there was a haze and they couldn't see and they thought the houses were on fire and you begin to put stuff in perspective of where your life and where your foundation is on. 
because you think in that moment we didn't know what was going on and it turned out for the good that we just had to have some things that a little bit of money could fix and it was fine. But in that moment, I had a choice to say, everything's gone, could be gone. And what do I do? But in that moment, thank you, Jesus, that I knew that my foundation was built on the one who saved me, who redeemed me, who's restored me. I told the kids this morning as I was teaching in Proverbs 12, and it begins to talk about these words of hurt are like a sword that pierce you. But the words that are, that are good will build up those people that are maybe in hurting. And I, I told them this morning, and I want you to hear this because I feel that this is a word maybe from the Lord this morning. As I told them, and it, it doesn't describe this, but I told them that as a sword pierces you, there's something that left after the doctors get done. You know, you have a surgery. Maybe it doesn't pierce your vital parts, but the words that come pierce you like a sword that are that are just bad and when you pull that sword out there's one thing that remains and it's a scar and I feel like this morning that there may be some of you here that the church has entered that sword that that sword into your side and it's pierced you and there's a scar left and I want you to know this morning that Jesus loves you that the church is going to fail you. But Jesus is still on the throne and he loves you. He sent his only son to die for you. He, God sent his only son, Jesus, to die for you. And the word says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. And I ask you this morning, if you don't know the one who created the world, who sets time in motion, who all things are through him and by him, that he loves you so much that Jesus would go to the cross for you, that today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that there was a man that built his house upon the sand, and there was one that built his house upon the rock. And when the winds and they, they came and the floods came, guess what the one that was built in sand did? It was tore down and blown away, washed away. But the one that built himself on the rock, and that rock, his name is Jesus. When the winds came and the floods came, guess who stands? And so, Lord, right now, as we sing this, Lord, I pray that our foundation would be upon you and nothing else. Lord, that this foundation would be the one that we stand on. So if you're here today and you say you don't know Jesus, I just encourage you, if that's you and you come down front, you look at me and I would love to pray with you this morning. Lord, we love you.
Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this moment. And God, we do stand in awe of you, all of what you've done for us as believers, as individuals. And God, I pray, Lord, that uh, God, my heart is this, is that God, that no one in this place, in this room, God, would ever hear one day that they will never hear one day that where you would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. That no one in this room, God, would ever hear those words. That God, we just get so consumed with, with doing the right thing or saying the right things and doing... Christianity but we forget that it's about a relationship with you I pray God that we're not so consumed with but yet God we are more consumed with you God that we are not consumed with good works but God that we are consumed with you Oh God, that's my heart. My heart is this, Lord, that we would not hear those words. But instead, God, let us hear these words one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant, the one that I've known, the one that knows me, the one that loves my heart that I've captured and held on to, that you have not departed, that your love for him continues to increase each and every day, each and every hour, each and every year, that we fall deeper and deeper in love with a Savior that loves us more than we can even imagine. 
So even as we leave this place, let us leave in peace. I pray, God, that if there's conviction here in this room, God, that that conviction leads us into your presence, I pray. May it lead us into your presence, I pray. Not away from your presence. God, you, you love us too much to let us be where we're at, to let us be where you don't want us to be. So I thank you for the conviction. I pray, God, that it moves our heart to cry out to you, to come before you boldly, to repent, to declare all that you've done for us. Let us run into your arms once again, I pray. So God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for your church. I pray, God, the blessings upon them. I pray favor upon them. I pray, God, as they leave this place, God, they, they're not leaving your presence, but God, your presence is moving in and through them. God, that they become effective in their workplace, effective in their stores. God, effective in this community, in their neighborhoods, in their homes, I pray. Let us be the light of this world that is so desperately in need of a Savior, in need of a one that loves them, I pray. In Jesus' name, may you have all the glory. We say we love you in a prayer. It's just not some nice saying that I say that I say because we're closing. But God, let it be birthed out of a real love and affection towards you. So we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Honestly, truly. Thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.